Thank you, Kei Hosro, and everybody for, for hosting this, uh, this fireside. I can't believe it's the 21st. That says an awful lot about the year, but uh, never mind. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to, uh, to be able to introduce uh, Masudo Lufani uh, tonight because I've actually had the, the privilege and the chance to work with him in the past, uh, and, uh, and it's wonderful to be able to work with him again on, on this project. Uh, previously, Masood was interviewed for a project that I uh, worked on called RaceUnity.us, which is a big oral history project uh, about uh, race and the building uh, race and, and building uh, towards race unity in, in the United States. And I encourage everybody to, to go and, uh, and look at the videos there, and especially to look at Masood's uh, wonderful videos, which cover his, uh, his upbringing uh, in, uh, in New York. Masood was born in California and Los Angeles and grew up mostly in New York, and he became a Baha'i in uh, university. And, uh, and, and then he, uh, he grew up to be an artist. Masood is a, an actor and a writer and a mixed media artist with a special focus on uh, sculpture. And he, uh, he, he, he learned these, he graduated from, the, uh, the Moore, from Morehouse College and the Savannah College of Art and Design. And uh, Masood is uh, now uh, a practicing artist and sculptor. He, uh, he has had a number of residencies uh, around the world and uh, received a number of grants and awards for his work. And some of the, uh, the significant uh, parts of his work uh, include being creative director for a global healing project called Blocked, which is a multimedia performance project created to memorialize spaces around the trauma of the transatlantic strafe, slave trade. So these are some just little highlights of uh, Masood's background that uh, I found very interesting. And, uh, and he speaks about this uh, in his uh, Race Unity videos as well. And I think tonight he's going to give us a really very interesting talk. It's called uh, The Spook Who Sat by the Door decoding the penetrating vision of the pupil of the eye. And I, I don't want to uh, prejudge uh, Masood's talk or, or to tell you anything uh, about it really, except to tell you a little bit about the title. Um, so uh, The Spook Who Sat By The Door is a 1969 film uh, about uh, race in America and about the way uh, African-American people had learned to observe what was happening around them um, and to, to, to really, through that, uh, that observation, that insight to expose the contradictions and the hypocrisies and the injustice that really lie at the heart of, of American life because of uh, the, the disease, uh, the spiritual disease of racism. And, uh, and uh, Masood will bring, I think, uh, a, to a discussion about that film, uh, the, uh, the, also this passage from the Baha'i writings about the pupil of the eye. Uh, and uh, the pupil of the eye is something that uh, Baha'u'llah used to refer to people of African descent because uh, the pupil of the eye, uh, in the pupil of the eye is seen the reflection of that which is before it. In other words, the reality of the world around it. Uh, and also from the pupil of the eye, the light of the, of the spirit shine, shineth forth. And I think tonight we'll have a chance to hear from a gentleman of, uh, of quite distinguished and varied uh, accomplishments and, uh, and work, uh, an insight that, that really bridges this spiritual teaching from the Baha'i writings um, uh, and, uh, and the way that has informed the, the spirit of our age of, of trying to appreciate as a whole human race what the oneness of humanity actually means. So I hope that made sense. I hope uh, it does justice to what Masood is going to tell us and I hand you over to, to him. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Salim, for that uh, really uh, generous uh, introduction. I, uh, you know, I'm glad that you, uh, that you truncated it a bit, brother. It, it gets, uh, you know, I've been doing a couple of these talks, man, I tell you, there's nothing like getting bored with uh, hearing about some things that you've been involved in or even hearing yourself speak after a while. So uh, I appreciate you, brother. It's always good to see you. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, and again, to, uh, to kind of extend this uh, pool of humanity to include uh, these beautiful faces from across the pond. So. Uh, so happy to uh, to see you all and thank you for allowing me to uh, take a little bit of your time I know that uh, there are a lot of things that you could be doing on Sunday evening and uh, The fact that you have created a space for me to be with you and to share is uh, Is quite an honor um, As Salim uh, uh, explained quite quite beautifully uh, there's a kind of um, a subtext of this talk which is centered around a film uh, called uh, the spook who sat by the door but the larger text, I would say, the largest uh, um, kind of conceptual idea behind this talk is, um, is about this idea of the uh, pupil of the eye, which of course is a reference that Abdu'l-Baha um, in the Baha'i writings uh, talks about uh, that being a spiritual distinction of people of African uh, descent. Um, 
Spook Inside by the Door was a film um, which is based on a, um, a novel that was released in 1969 uh, by a writer named Sam Greenlee. Uh, the film was released, actually released in 1973. It was uh, directed and produced by um, a brilliant actor and um, film producer named Ivan Dixon, who if you don't know who Ivan Dixon was, I encourage you to, to look him up. He was an extraordinary uh, artist. Uh, the kind of narrative structure of the of the film and of the book follows a uh, fictitious character, um, uh, Mr. Freeman, who is um, described as being the first graduate of the uh, CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, here in the United States, the first black graduate of that agency. And um, he's engaged in his training at a time of great uh, kind of political and social upheaval here in the United States. Of course, we're talking about the late 60s. Uh, we're on the, um, you know, we're on the um, backside of the uh, gains of the civil rights movement, um, the voting rights legislation, uh, the death of Dr. Martin Luther King in 1968. Of course, that uh, was preceded by the death of Malcolm X and also the death of Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy. So, we have um, this, uh, all of this political and social upheaval and this book um, being published uh, in the wake of all of those social con conflagrations. And the book follows this character, Mr. Freeman, through his training in the um, Central Intelligence Agency where he learns a lot of the covert tactics, um, the um, tactics of spying and surveillance that are so key to a field operative uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency. During the course of the story, he um, becomes disillusioned because of the uh, racial dynamics of America and quite impatient with the slow progress uh, and, and the slow rate of change and actually decides to use the skills that he acquired in the Central Intelligence Agency to become the leader of a, a paramilitary group, which was focused on overthrowing um, the racist power structure of the U.S. government. For our consideration here, of course, we will leave that part of the story to the side because the Baha'i Faith is quite clear um, about uh, prohibiting violence um, in terms of um, protest and standing up for justice. Primarily for our consideration, we're gonna turn our attention to this um, concept of the pupil of the eye and how it relates to the film and how the film can be a kind of conceptual jumping off point that can allow us to see and understand um, that spiritual distinction perhaps in a in a different light. I'd like to begin by just talking about the idea of the term spook. Um, the term spook has multiple meanings uh, in the context of the film. Um, it is really instructive that uh, Greenlee titled his book, The Spook Who Sat By The Door. I think in some sense he was uh, pulling his inspiration from this kind of um, expansive and multivalent capacity of the black vernacular tradition, which often encodes meaning um, and uh, kind of creates space for multiple meanings of one term. For example, if I were to say something like, um, yo, that's dope. In one context, that means that's cool. That was really cool what you did. I liked what you did. But if I were to say, yo, that's dope, that also can refer to drugs or illegal, um, you know, illegal substances. Same word, different meaning, depending on the context, the phrasing, the intonation. If I were to say, whew, whew, it's cool in here, you guys know that I mean that it's cold. But if I were to say, yo, man, it's cool in here, that means I like the environment. Same word, two different meanings. This has a long tradition in the black community, which um, began its long trek through the vast wilderness known as America under this state of perpetual surveillance um, from the time of the first slave ships leaving the west coast of Africa across its long voyage um, across the Atlantic to the Caribbean and to the United States. Indeed, the black people who entered the belly of the ship were uh, represented a mixture of African, African communities and African cultural groups. Um, you had Mandingos, you had Fulanis, you had Igbos, you had Twi, you had any number of um, of African cultural groups represented. And from the moment they were tethered together and marched into that ship, they were under a state of perpetual observation and surveillance. Of course, we know that coming from the various different cultural groups that they came from, they spoke different languages and they had to find ways 
to communicate that would transcend the strictures, uh, the, the strictures of, um, of language and would become something universal. Initially, that started off through the power of the drum, which was a ubiquitous instrument that was uh, represented by many different Af African cultures as the basis of their musical tradition. And then as they entered the theater of, um, of uh, Western slavery, um, they, the drum was taken once it was realized that the Africans were communicating with themselves through the drum and passing covert operative messages through the tempo, the beat, the rhythm of the drum. And the owner of the plantation, the fields in which they worked, recognized that this could be used as a method for constructive resilience, if you will, um, to escape and wanting to avoid loss of property, they confiscated the drum. So in the context of this kind of idea of observation and perpetual surveillance, it is worth considering the term spook, which again has multiple meanings. In one sense, it refers to an operative, a secret servant agent, somebody who is observing secretly, who study the ways of, of um, entering a space and not being seen. A spook is also a ghost, an apparition, um, a specter. It also has a pejorative meaning in regards to people of African descent, black people in America, because it also refers to the darkness of the skin um, as a racist trope. And the term spook was used to denigrate black people by saying that at nighttime you can't see them unless they smile, so hence the term spook. So you have this triangulation of these three meanings um, kind of contained within the title of spook who sat by the door. And Greenlee was anything if he was not um, specific in how he used language and uh, I think quite brilliant in naming the film that because it constantly expands and evolves on the possible and potential um, meanings that it unfolds. I'd like to, to, for a moment, just to take a kind of mental trek back in time to the year 1898, before we delve further into the film. Because it was in 1898 that the first African-American entered the Baha'i faith. It was a man named Robert Turner, who happened to be the butler for the wealthy uh, Hearst family in California, which is a publishing powerhouse family. Of course, uh, many of us know the story of uh, Mr. Butler. He had formerly been, been an enslaved African, and after the Emancipation Proclamation, the end of slavery, he uh, found work as a butler. Um, this time, continuing his condition of certitude voluntarily. But of course, we know that the um, opportunities for people of African descent to advance themselves in terms of their career opportunities were really circumscribed. So we probably didn't have many choices. But nevertheless, it was somewhat better than the state of imposed certitude that was the perpetual condition of people of African descent here in America and beyond. In 1898, um, the beloved master, the perfect exemplar of the Baha'i teaching, the son of the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, received a photographic image of Mr. Turner in the mail. This was prior to Mr. Turner's pilgrimage to Haifa uh, to visit with the master and visit the pilgrim sites of the uh, Baha'i world community. And Abdul Baha, when looking upon the picture, remarked about uh, his countenance. And if you ever see a picture of Mr. Turner, he has this very dignified look. He has this kind of blue black skin, rich and deep, like the color of oil. There is a dignity and a bearing about him that is quite extraordinary. And indeed stands in stark contrast to his social condition, again, which was a state of certitude. Abdul Baha looks at his picture and he says, thou art dark in countenance, but beautiful, you know. Thou art like the pupil of the eye, the very wellspring of light. And hence begins this kind of association of this concept of the pupil of the eye with people of African descent. Later he would go on and he would describe all people of African descent as being associated with this spiritual distinction of pupil of the eye. Of course, we know that 
from a biological standpoint, the pupil has a very specific function. It allows light to enter the eye. In essence, vision is not possible without that apparatus which permits light to enter the eye. A light in some sense can also be closely aligned or associated with this spiritual law of the truth, this virtue of the truth, upon which all the other spiritual virtues of God are based and built upon. Indeed, one cannot claim oneself to be courageous, or loving, or compassionate, or forgiving, if indeed it is not founded and grounded on an internal truth that is reflected in one's actions and one's attitudes in how one interacts with one's brothers and sisters. Truth. Indeed, we go on and we can see another example of Abdu'l-Bahá you know, interacting with the community of people of African descent here in America, of course, in the early 1900s when he is traveling throughout the United States to bring the message of his beloved father, the Lord of the Age, Baha'u'lláh, to the West. He stops in Washington, D.C., and he is invited to a dinner at an illustrious uh, home of a Baha'i woman um, in a very um, exclusive area of Washington, D.C. We also know from that history that he had spoken at Howard University, one of the historically black colleges in Washington, D.C. And indeed, the home of some of the members of the Talented Tenth, which was a select group of black intellectuals who were kind of thrust at the fore of black intellectualism during the early 1900s. Amongst that group of black intellectuals um, counted as a member of the Talented Tenth was a man by the name of Louis Gregory, who was an attorney who had studied at Howard University. And during this dinner that was given in the honor of the master, Mr. Gregory came by the home of this distinguished Baha'i woman and stood in the parlor as the guests were ushered into the dining room with all of its beautiful settings and its fine china and its beautiful silverware. And the beloved master, Abdu'l-Bahá, of course, looked around the room and we know from the, many of you know from this uh, story, uh, the potency of this story and how important it is to Baha'i history. He looked around and I'm summarizing, but he said, in essence, where is Mr. Gregory? Um, the hostess, said, well, he's in the parlor, obeying the customs of segregation that were such an intrinsic part of life here in America during that time. Abdu'l-Bahá Abdul ushered and said, bring him to me. And immediately someone came and got Mr. Gregory and bought him in the room. And he was seated in a place of honor next to Abdu'l-Bahá. Now, I would say that this instance, this episode, taken in tandem with the episode with the first African-American Baha'i to enter the faith, constitutes a kind of hammer fell in the history of race relations in America. Remember, when Abdu'l-Bahá compared the first black African, -Amer the first African-American Baha'i to the people of the eye, this was some 70 years prior to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. This was some nearly six decades before the beautiful, majestic personage of Rosa Parks decided not to give up her seat on a Montgomery bus. Indeed, he in a way was sending a hammer, sending a hammer fell through time that would reverberate for generations. And I think taken in context, we have to understand and reconcile with how revolutionary this was to take a dejected and objectified, a brutalized people and elevate them through a spiritual distinction to the forefront of spiritual transformation of the world. Indeed, we also know that Abdu'l-Bahá, who is this unique figure in the history of the Baha'i faith, unique indeed in the history of the world's great religions. He had many appellations or title that were associated with his station. He was called the mystery of God. He was called the limb of the law of God, the being around whom all names revolve, the ensign 
of the most great peace, the moon of the central orb of this most holy dispensation. But we know in spite of all those titles, the one that he was most wedded to and he loved the most was the title of servant. So in some sense, spiritually and conceptually, Abdu'l-Bahá is linking himself to a people who have lived under the yoke of imposed certitude and saying, this is my distinction. Servitude to all the human race is my perpetual religion. Now, jumping back again to the film, The Spook Who Sat By The Door, and Mr. Freeman, the first black CIA agent, as talked about in the narrative structure of the film, goes through his training. And he, yearn, he learns these covert methods of covert observation. But of course, this is nothing new for him. You see, this power of active observation, not passive, but active, was something in some sense that was encoded in his DNA. In a seminal moment in the film, he says a black man with a tray or a broom can go anywhere in the world and remain invisible. He can enter any room. What Greenlee essentially is saying, he's taking this idea of this perpetual social position of certitude imposed upon people of African descent in the culture of America. And he's saying that that positionality, though dehumanizing, can be transformed with a kind of spiritual alchemy through a practice of active observation that can serve as a method for constructive resilience, endurance, and indeed transcendence by devising methodologies for survival in light of the information gained through active observation. Why do I say it was encoded in his DNA? Since the first Africans stepped on the shores of America, their survival was tethered to how well they knew the ways of their owners. They had to watch the facial expressions of the master of the house. They had to study what was pleasing or displeasing to the mistress of the house. They had to watch the body language of the overseer, decode what behaviors might result in a beating, or worse, a hanging. And then they had to take all of that language, all of that observational information, run it through this mental and spiritual processor, and devise ways of moving through time and space that would ensure their survival, and indeed the survival of their children and the generations yet to come. Active observation developed over time out of necessity because of the existential threat imposed upon black bodies in public spaces in America. And we can see this expression of this keen ability to observe, to have this salient and cogent analysis of the fault line, the fissures of the racial landscape in America expressed in the artistic expression of the black American community. It begins on the cotton fields, the tobacco and sugar fields of the deep south with the field holler songs. Continues on to the spirituals, which invoke the scriptures, but also within those spirituals embedded the language of escape, of subterfuge, of means of survival and adapting to a situation that constantly threats your psychic and your mental and physical well-being, your spiritual well-being. Songs such as Follow the Drinking Gourd, 
It's a constellation of stars in the sky that point northward. Essential information if you're trying to escape north and cross the Ohio River from the Deep South. We also know, of course, that Baha'u'llah in 1839 delivers the Tablet of Emancipation in which an enslaved African living in his household who had been passed down to him from the household of his father ask the Lord of the age, Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith for his freedom. And Baha'u'llah pins this extraordinary, extraordinary response in the form of a tablet. Some 15 years prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. And he says, I call thee to witness at this moment that I verily have set him free in thy path, liberated him in thy name, and lifted from his neck the shackles of certitude, that he may serve thee in the daytime and in the night season, whilst I pray that thou mayest never free mine own neck from the chain of thy certitude. Now we know, of course, from the teachings of the Baha'i Faith, those of you who are attending this Zoom meeting who are Baha'is, that when a revelation of God enters the earth, when it enters the hearts of humanity, that it impacts everything in the physical and material world. And so one can look at this tablet from Baha'u'llah, again, penned in 1839, and see its spiritual conceptual connection to a song that was composed in 1865. The majestic song, Go Tell It on the Mountain, which would be repurposed during the civil rights movement and links the story of Moses and his leading the children of Israel from under the yoke of oppression under Pharaoh into the land of milk and honey linking that story to the journey of African-American people seeking their own freedom under the Pharaoh of the US government. And that great freedom fighter, the indomitable family, Fannie Lou Hamer, repurposed this song in the civil rights movement and she sang, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, Go tell it on the mountain to let my people go. So linking that song, born on the heels or in the wake of Baha'u'llah's tablet of emancipation, the revelation impacting everything that it touches and infuses it with a new vitality and spirit. But it doesn't stop there. And we look at the artistic and the musical traditions of Black America, and we see the impact of the revelation on these traditions as well. Whether people were Baha'is or not Baha'is, they are still being impacted by the power of the revelation. We see it in the blues, the blues of Muddy Waters, of Johnny Lee Hooker. We see it in jazz. We see it in the soul songs of Aretha Franklin, of Donny Hathaway. We see it in Stevie Wonder's musical tradition. But not only that, we also see it in hip hop. Yes, we see it in hip hop. An often dismissed and ridiculed art form that nevertheless in its best links in artistry, a transcendent capacity, much like that of the great Barb Shakespeare himself. And one of her most powerful pieces, Everything is Everything, perhaps one of the greatest MCs of all time, Lauren Hill. And I want you to hear these words because it's important. And then I'm gonna turn it and I want you to, to listen to a quote from Baha'u'llah and see the conceptual and spiritual links between these two things. Lauren Hill says, I philosophy possibly speak time, beat drums, Abyssinian, street Baptists, wrap this in fine linen from the beginning. My practice extends across the atlas. I begat this, flipping in the ghetto on the dirty mattress. You can't match this, rapper slash 
actress, more powerful than two Cleopatras, bomb graffiti on the tomb of Nefertiti. MCs ain't ready to take it to the Serengeti. My mind is heavy like the mind of Sister Betty. Shabazz, L boogie sparks with stars and constellations, then came down for a little constant consultation, adjacent to the king, fear no human being. Now hear this mixture where hip hop meets scripture. Take a negative and develop it into a positive picture. One can tra trace the links of that powerful recitation by Lauren Hill. From this statement from Baha'u'llah where he says, a lover fear of nothing and no harm come nigh him. Thou seest him chill in the fire and dry in the sea. This practice of act active observation, transmuted, transformed into art, diagnosing the situations around you, the complexity of our social landscape, our spiritual landscape, pointing out how racism, how materialism operates as an integral part of society, then transforming it, transmuting it into the expressive power of art, impacted and influenced by the reverberations of the revelation. In jazz, the great composition by Les McCann and Eddie Harris, composed in 1969 compared to what? Listen to how these lyrics reflect another teaching by Baha'u'llah. They say, possession is the motivation that's hanging up the doggone nation. Looks like we are always in a rut trying to make it real compared to what? Now hold that lyric in your mind and listen to these words from the beloved beauty Baha'u'llah. <laughs> the world is a passing show, vain and empty, bearing the mere semblance of reality. Set not your affections upon it. Break not the bond that uniteth you with your creator. Verily I say the world is like the vapor in the desert which the thirsty striveth after it with all his might until he cometh unto it and findeth it to be mere illusion. There almost seems to be this kind of mystical spiritual call and response between Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, the Lord of the age, and the beleaguered, the maligned, the marginalized, the oppressed community of black Americans in the West. Indeed, Baha'u'llah is speaking to everyone but in terms of the narrative of African-Americans, that conversation is filtered through the spiritual distinction of pupil of the eye and the reverberations of that teachings being felt in the prophetic tradition of black artistic expression. Returning back to the film, a spook who sat by the door. And Mr. Freeman goes on and he uses these tactics of covert observation, of active observation, again, that comes from a long tradition within the black community tethered to our survival. And he becomes the leader of a paramilitary group to overthrow the government. And from there, the film descends into a bit of violence and chaos. But the foregrounding of that idea of perception, of the ability to make a keen and astute analysis of the situation surrounding us. And then to utilize that information as a means for survival is a key component for the work that the Baha'i world community is engaged in in bringing about this new civilization that is based on justice, equality, human dignity, and the oneness of humanity. Light enters the eye through the mechanism of the pupil. Light as truth, all human virtues, all spiritual virtues, all divine virtues based on this spiritual virtue of the truth. And it seems to me that this community holds within itself the capacity to assess for humanity, the social conditions, the spiritual conditions 
of our surroundings. And then in conjunction with our partners through consultation, working in the field, serving one another, to translate that information into methodologies of constructive resilience that can transform the world. The Bible says, an eye for an eye makes everybody blind. So when we are engaged in a practice so debilitating and so harmful and so spiritually, mentally, and physically destructive as institutionalized racism, we are denying ourselves the power of vision and of sight. Indeed, we are blinding ourselves of our collective capacity to recognize the truth. And then based on that information, to come up with methodologies to address, cope with, and transcend the perplexity of our present moment. Interesting to know, African Americans aren't given the distinction of pupil of the eye because we are encoded with some kind of special DNA within our genes. It is because of the suffering that this grace of Baha'u'llah was bestowed upon the community. On my father's side, my father's people come from Central Texas. They come from a long tradition of people who pick cotton on the cotton fields of Central Texas. My mother's people cut sugarcane in the cane fields of the Caribbean in St. Croix Island. On my maternal grandfather's side, they pick cotton, Sea Island cotton, the world's most famous cotton in South Carolina. This positionality of imposed certitude, which runs in my bloodline, is nevertheless a source of extreme pride and encouragement to me. Because I am buoyed by that spiritual distinction of pupil of the eye as bestowed upon me from Abdul Baha himself. So when I enter the world and I am feeling a bit surveilled or under observation, when I'm in mixed setting and someone says something that can be perceived as being racist or at the very least prejudiced, when I'm feeling the perplexity of my condition and I'm struggling to maintain my sense of self, my sense of self-esteem as I move through the world, I am lifted up by that distinction. And I know that in spite of that lineage, that legacy of imposed certitude under the brutal legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, institutionalized racism, my positionality in this revelation is at the forefront of spiritual transformation. So it does not matter where my people came from, what they endured, what they suffered, how they were marginalized, oppressed, beaten, and broken. I know that in spite of that reality, out of the crucible of that pain, comes this capacity to keenly observe and see reality. We also know, of course, that methods of constructive resilience are not unique to people of African descent. Indeed, my brothers and sisters in Iran have also exhibited an extraordinary capacity to create methodologies for survival. The development of a school system that, that uh, operates underground in response to the refusal of the government to educate Baha'i children is an example of this. In some sense, that practice also echoes the learned enslaved African who beyond all odds learned how to read and write and would operate covertly to teach his fellow enslaved Africans to read and to write passing that knowledge on 
from one person to the next. These two communities, separated by thousands of miles, echoing each other in these constructive creative responses to oppression, to marginalization, to degradation. So we know that this capacity to survive, when these abilities are wedded to faith, to the revelation, human beings can do extraordinary things. We can overcome our circumstances. We can transform a nation that is dripping with the words of interposition and nullification that is still being weighed down by the legacy of racism, bigotry, and injustice. We can take those scattered shards of that beleaguered system, transmute it, transform it through a kind of spiritual alchemy and create a divine civilization. Baha'is all over the world now are engaged in this process that we call core activities, which is a set of community-based practices that are meant to help to spiritualize our community. Fundamental to this is this building of meaningful relationships with members of our community, taking on the responsibility of transforming our neighborhoods through service, through study of the sacred text, through communal devotionals. In a recent letter from the Universal House of Justice, the Supreme Governing Body, they talk about the power of meaningful relationships in transforming the world. What do I mean by meaningful? If I look around and I take a sobering assessment of my friendships and my, the people that I associate with on a day-to-day -day basis, and holding within my mind and my consciousness that the central principle of the Baha'i faith is the oneness of mankind. And I look at those set of friendships and they all look like me, there is a problem. There is a problem. How can, I, can my life reflect in spirit, word, and deed a fidelity to what it is that I say I believe in? if all of my associations look like I do. Now, what does that mean? That means I have to develop a capacity to be a little bit uncomfortable with being so comfortable. What am I saying? I'm saying at the core of building relationships, across cultural groups, across social economic divides, across languages, is an ability to endure the discomfort necessary to build the relationship. One of the central figures of the Baha'i faith, the beloved guardian, who's the grandson of Abdul Baha, Shoghi Effendi, in the Advent for Divine Justice, his masterful, masterful treatise, says that there are specific actions that the black community and the white community need to take in the eradication of racism. And again, we know that in America, racism is our most vital and challenging issue. Vital why? Vital in a couple of ways. Vital because that refers to the physicality, the biology, the health of the body politic, right? So vital in that sense, but also vital in terms of its general importance in the welfare of the nation, challenging because it is infected, racism has infected every aspect of this great experiment called democracy here in America. There is not a facet of human life that you can go to where the stain, the residue of racism does not in some way leave its mark. Vital and challenging. The Guardian says, white people have to demonstrate themselves worthy of being trusted. Now, why does he say that? Why does he say that? Recently, when I gave a talk, a dear sister asked me, she said, Masood, I, I want to ask you a question. And again, when I, when I have an opportunity to have these conversations with communities, no matter where they are, I, I love questions. It doesn't matter what the question is. There really aren't, um, one has to work very hard to come up with a dumb question, as far as I'm concerned. It's possible, <laughs> but you have to put in the work. 
She asked me, she said, why do African Americans congregate amongst themselves in public spaces? Do, are you really, do you really want oneness? My response to my sister, who was asking an honest question because she wanted some understanding, and I love that kind of frankness and that honesty. I said to her, the relationship of the African American community to the American government is like a woman being in an abusive relationship for some 401 years. Post-traumatic stress, distrust becomes an integral part of the way that battered woman interacts with the world around her. The guardian with this penetrating ability to recognize the human condition, diagnose the ailments that afflict humanity in America, to clearly see the complexity of the racial issue, looked at that and said, trust has to be restored because it was at the core of the violation. So that is for the white community, yes? And then he goes on and he says to the black community, once trust has been demonstrated, you have to demonstrate your capacity to forgive. These two separate behaviors, intrinsically interwoven, interdependent, not mutually exclusive, they are essential to the solving of the race issue. And the guidance of the beloved guardian, a love letter to the American Baha'i community, giving us that guidance of what we need to do in order to cure ourselves of the spiritual disease and the blight of racism. And essential to that work is the ability to have an astute observation a clear and objective analysis of the landscape, of the social fabric, of the spiritual state, and then to develop, to conceive, to create methodologies for constructive resilience that are redemptive, that are regenerative, that are based on justice and equality and human dignity. For Baha'is around the world, part of that process is based on these core activities. Part of having meaningful relationships is inviting people who don't look like me into my home and saying, hey, look, I know we come from two different backgrounds. You're from the north side, I'm from the south. You have a soul, so do I. We're different. But ah, we are bound by our primary identity, which is spiritual in nature. Our secondary identity. I'm a black American. I'm an artist. I am a graduate of Morehouse College. All secondary identities. But it's my primary identity as a spiritual human being that allows me to look at Pete and say, there goes my father to look at Salim and say, there goes my brother, to look at Martin and say, there goes my uncle. It is that spiritual identity that binds us all, that is the cement that makes of humanity one family. And make no mistake about it, the Baha'i faith is not about a notion of oneness through uniformity. One of the great blessings of Baha'u'llah that he's given to humanity is a recognition that unity is predicated on diversity. So it is the richness of our cultural differences, our languages, the foods we eat, the way that we relate to one another that adds to the dynamic force of God's creative expression. I don't know about y'all, there are days that I like Italian food Sometimes I like Jamaican food. There are days that I want seafood. Sometimes I want Persian rice. I love the fact that in this revelation, Baha'u'llah says, that is the foundation upon which unity is based. The dynamic force of diversity. So, again, this capacity to observe to see, 
to cogently take a ac accurate assessment of our social situation, of our spiritual condition, in the context of the Black American community to transform that into art through music, through literature, through the writings of people like Robert Hayden, through Langston Hughes, through Toni Morrison, uh, through the theater, through people like Lorraine Hansberry, uh, through people like James Earl Jones and Paul Robeson, in dance, uh, all the other art forms, to transmute that analysis, that ability to perceive into art as a restorative mechanism for survival and also as a gift to humanity to shed light on the complexity of our circumstances and hopefully to illumine the way forward. When you weld that capacity with the dynamic force, the transcendent power of the revelation, what you have is something that is so majestic and powerful that the world will never be the same. Unity predicated on diversity is our spiritual and material reality. The realization of the oneness of mankind is not a question of if, it's only a matter of when. And all of us joining hands across culture, across language, across gender, indeed across religious affiliation, not allowing those barriers, those perceived social barriers, to become impediments to seeing our shared humanity. Refusing to be stymied by those imposed limitations. Joining hands. Seeing as the beloved guardian said, the face of God in every human face. Learning from one, one another, growing together, loving each other. For it is the power of love, divine love, that bears within it the capacity to bind hearts, to transcend the circumstances of our condition, and to make of this old world a new world. Indeed, to make the beloved community at long last a reality. I often quote the great poet John Donne, I believe who was, a, if I'm not mistaken, um, he was from England, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Dr. King used to quote him all the time in one of his speeches, and I, I also uh, like to quote him because I think it is, um, it is a powerful way to kind of conceive this notion of our shared humanity. John Donne used to say, we're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied together forever in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some... Uh, for some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. No man is an island unto himself. Each man a piece of the continent, a part of the whole. And then he goes on towards the end to say, any man's death diminishes me. For I'm involved in mankind. Therefore never seek to know for whom that bell tolls. Because it tolls for thee. And I will shut up and let's have some conversation because I'm tired of talking. <laughs> Masood, thank you. There's a lot of silent clapping happening all over, this, all over the screen. <laughs> thank you so much for such a wide ranging and, and an interesting talk. And, you know, as you spoke, as you were giving these examples of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of insights that you found uh, in the African-American tradition, African-American history, African-American artistic expression, where, uh, where these, uh, these examples of, the, of the, the spiritual capacity of the people of the eye being exercised. Uh, it reminded me of a talk that I heard years ago uh, where um, Sohail Bashuri, the great uh, Baha'i Lebanese uh, um, academic uh, and, uh, and scholar of the, uh, of the Romantic poets, gave this amazing talk and he talked about all of these uh, incidences uh, uh, where the romantic poets were talking about um, what, what could be argued was a, a kind of a foreshadowing of, of the, the rebirth of, of mankind. And yeah. so it just reminded me of, uh, it felt like your, your talk um, in that, in that, when you were speaking on, on those points, felt like the updating of the same material and that here we can look at the African-American tradition and experience and see these same 
examples of, uh, of the revelation in action through art. Uh, people who yeah. don't even know what they're expressing in a way, they are they're in touch with that uh, spirit. <laughs> and uh, I think another really interesting point that uh, really jumped out for me was the, uh, the way you talked about the, the fact that this, uh, this reality, this, ex this, this, this expression of the soul being the pupil of the eye is a, is a, is a function of suffering. Uh, and it, uh, it reminded me also of, uh, of the wonderful American, African-American Baha'i uh, psychologist, Dr. Joy DeGru, mm -hmm. who uh, many people on this, uh, on this call will know that she, uh, she has uh, written an extraordinary book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Uh, and uh, and in, uh, in this book, Dr. DeGru talks about how the suffering, the trauma borne by the uh, original uh, African uh, arrivals in North America, uh, the, the people who were enslaved, their, uh, their suffering was passed down over the generations, uh, even unto today, as a function of, of uh, epigenetics, as a function of, of, uh, of the experience being uh, taken on at, at a genetic level. Yeah. And so this, this uh, is a kind of a material corollary to what you're talking about, the, uh, of, the, of the spiritual uh, 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 experience of, of suffering and becoming through that suffering uh, something novel and unique uh, to this period of time uh, and with a unique role to play.